So the title is what it is. In terms of orientation and context, uh, this presentation is very broad uh, in general. I consider ancient mnemonics from an integrationist perspective. Uh, many of you are familiar with the work of Roy Harris. For those of you who are not, we'll jump very quickly to a brief consideration of that as background. I want to draw your attention to mnemonic traditions as a potential source of insight. And I want to demonstrate the usefulness and the flexibility of integrational semiology. Um, as I said, I'd like to quickly review Roy Harris's ideas and position my own research against this background. And this will set the stage for our consideration of Greco-Roman mnemonics, which I'll then compare with marking and writing, based on the fact that all of these things derive significant order from space. So what is the integrational view of writing? Uh, it's a theory of uh, integrational semi semiology is a basis for a theory of writing set forth by Roy Harris in his book, Signs of Writing. I'll quickly summarize the aspect, aspects most relevant to my work using quotes. The first thing to bear in mind, and this involves a little bit of a, a shift in perspective, is that communication is not viewed as a process of transferring thoughts or messages from one individual mind to another. From an integrationist perspective, communication itself whatever form it takes, is an integration of activities, rather than a separate form of activity carried out in addition to others. And the product of that integration, as well as its enabling mechanism, is the sign. The second important point is that writing integrates activities in time. For the integrationist, the key factor here is not sensory modality, but time. Time takes priority because time, being common to all sensory modalities, is the primary axis along which, for human beings, the various senses are themselves integrated. As a non-kinetic form, writing can, in principle, be processed and reprocessed as often as may be, and by as many people as have access to it, within the temporal limits determined by its own duration. So by non-kinetic, they mean that there's nothing moving. It allows for the establishment of a relatively lasting sign. In the case of sign language, gesture, uh, posture, these kinds of things, even speech itself, there's the movement of the vocal cords, the movement of the mouth, the movement of the hands. So by non-kinetic and relatively lasting, uh, Harris is referring to the fact that these things stay, allowing them, as we just said, to be processed and reprocessed in principle as often as may be. Third, the integrationist recognizes writing as spatial. This is a, 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 a very important point. It's the availability of space for the deployment of written forms which gives the syntagmatics of writing far greater variety and complexity than the syntagmatics of speech could ever have. Fourth, and this is quite important as well, the integrationist assumes no necessary relationship between writing and spoken language. From an integrational point of view, the mistake embodied in the traditional Western view of writing is plain. It confuses the function of the written sign with just one of its possible uses. An integrational semiology must show how and why the signs of writing function in a way that's basically different from the signs of speech, even when the purpose of a written text is to record a spoken message. And one last point not covered here is that for the integrationist, any consideration of writing is context dependent. So the kind of issues that you run into in attempting to create some sort of overarching uh, categorization, and you find that, well, they maybe fit into this aspect of the Venn diagram or maybe into this one. In each case, you have to look at it based on context, and in each case, there are going to be different things involved. I refer you to the book if you want to look into some of the details. So writing can be conceived of, at least as far as I see it, as contextualized memory. We just heard that this was a common viewpoint in antiquity with uh, the story that Plato relates in Phaedrus, and it's much more widespread than just with Plato. It seems self-evident that any temporal integration of activities or behavior is likely to involve memory. In Signs of Writing, Harris, Harris acknowledges the familiar fact that people write things down in order to remind themselves of what they might otherwise forget. But he cautions that any characterization of writing as an essentially mnemonic device entails mistaking this aspect of the temporality of writing for its communicative function. 
On the other hand, in the first chapter of the same book, he mentions a traditional classification of writing as an artificial representation that aids memory. I believe that's from the uh, Encyclopédie of uh, D'Alembert and uh, Diderot, if I can butcher some French today. Uh, in the same chapter, he remarks that the salient point to note for present purposes is that, contrary perhaps to all modern expectations, writing is not here counted as one of the ways available for transmitting thoughts, <coughs> nor in the formation of thoughts is writing recorded any role whatever. Its sole function is to retain the products of thoughts and to preserve them by artificial means. As I said, from an integrationist perspective, sign function depends upon context, upon the situation. This is probably the reason for the seeming ambiguity. Nevertheless, Harris clearly underscores the importance of memory in any consideration of writing. In any case, mnemonic traditions are of great interest to me. My experience has been that integrational semiology can be applied as usefully to ancient mnemonics in virtual space as it can be to environmental marks used by animals, or the letters or characters of writing proper deployed in graphic space. So, having covered the preliminary material, we can now have a look at ancient mnemonic systems. Uh, I do want to point out that the images that you'll see on the slides are from much later than the primary sources that we're going to be considering, but they correspond fairly well to the visualizations that those sources describe. So, bear with me, we don't have lots of great pictures from the 5th century BC to use to illustrate some of these points. So, we turn to Simonides of Sios and the origin story. In De Oratore, an important early source for the traditions we're considering, Cicero recounts the origin story associated with the art of memory. The poet Simonides of Sios is said to have invented the art of memory when he dined in Thessaly at the house of a nobleman who hired him to compose and recite a poem in honor of the host. Simonides did so, but in the same poem, he included a long passage referring to the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. When he was done, his host told him he'd only be paid half his fee, and that he should ask Castor and Pollux for the other half. A little later, a messenger came and told Simonides that two people were outside and they wanted to see him. He left the banquet hall to find them, but nobody was there. While he was outside, the banquet hall suddenly collapsed and crushed everyone horribly. All the guests died in red ruin. As the story goes, Simonides was able to identify the bodies for burial based on his memory of their disposition in space at their seats around the table, just as we are all here seated in positions at the table today. This sparked his discovery that clearness of memory consists in orderly arrangement. To quote Cicero, he inferred that persons desiring to train this faculty must select localities and form mental images of the facts they wish to remember and store those images in the localities, so the localities will preserve the order of the facts, and the images of the facts will designate the facts themselves, and we shall employ the localities and the images respectively as a wax writing tablet and the letters written upon it. Now that's sort of the bones of the story, but there's a, a fair amount of surviving early evidence. There are a number of more or less brief references to mnemonic systems in Greek texts from the 5th and 4th centuries BCE. Our ancient sources discussing the art at any length are all Latin books on rhetoric, but the mnemonic practices they describe are identified by the authors as Greek in origin, which is corroborated by our earliest explicit source, the Dialexis, which is an important sophisticated treatise written in literary Doric at some point after the end of the Peloponnesian War, so that puts it after about 404 uh, BCE. Now, Simonides was active in the 5th century, and even if there's no truth to the story associating him directly with the origins of the art, we know that an art of memory is mentioned in a number of 5th century texts, and that it was considered systematic enough to be taught. Cicero corroborates this with the story that a teacher of mnemonics approached Themistocles, offering to teach him, and that mnemonics were en vogue in Athens at that time, which was the late 6th and early 5th century. Now, the earliest known alphabetic inscriptions in Greek date from about 250 or 300 years before this time, leaving aside things like Linear B and the disappearance, the apparent disappearance of those uh, 
of, of, of those techniques during the period of the uh, Sea Peoples and the catastrophe that hit the, uh, the Mediterranean. So the point is that alphabetic writing at this time was still a relatively new development. In light of this fact, it seems possible that the art of memory preserves principles and techniques from a time before the widespread proliferation of linguistic writing. This possibility alone makes it worth our attention. So let's take a look at some of the fundamentals of the art of memory. Ancient authors recognized both natural and artificial memory. The latter, this is important, deriving from the former and functioning in the same way. The content of memory derives its order from real or virtual space. The spatial order is reflected in distinct places that hold images. Places might be the layout of a temple, uh, rooms in a house, uh, the 12 zodiacal regions, or even 36 decans, or 360 degrees that divided the space of the sky, the ecliptic. It could be a road we've traveled, or even a picture, or a diagram. A strong emphasis is placed on the backgrounds being unchanging. These are the writing surface. So given the images that we place virtually upon this surface are likely to change, the backgrounds themselves had to be lasting in order to anchor the memories that we wish to recall. Vision is recognized as dominant. Emphasis is placed on seeing the images. Sound is considered ephemeral, necessitating its association with images for recollection. Emotion plays a role in forming lasting images. Petty or boring images make no impression on the imagination. So images, according to our sources, should be emotionally striking. This includes otherworldly and grotesque figures. Now, breaking a large amount of material into smaller sets, or what's today called chunking, is also recommended. We're also told to associate what we wish to remember with what we already know. This, again, ties into the emphasis on fixed backgrounds or places to hold the changing images or signs. Lastly, repetition is central to the art, particularly when it comes to memorizing passages verbatim, given that speech leaves no visual impression in and of itself. Well, now let's take a look at the content of these places. Our early sources all refer to images that seem like scenes or vignettes featuring three-dimensional settings and persons. Images of words are also mentioned, but these seem to take the form of visible three-dimensional objects. One of our sources, Quintilian, mentions the visualization of a single word to call up whole passages. He also describes how signs such as an anchor or a weapon can represent navigation or warfare. And he goes on to say that, quote, we may, it is true, like shorthand writers, have definite images for everything. This might refer to graphical notation of some kind, and it should uh, direct our attention, if any of this makes us curious, to Greek traditions for tachygraphy or shorthand in ancient days, where you have contractions of letters into complex signs that are st uh, still abbreviations, and in many cases, symbols that appear to have no relationship to the alphabet, but were in some fashion used to help us remember. It appears that non-linguistic non marks, images, and presumably text itself could be used interchangeably for mnemonic purposes. The early sources all mentioned memory for words and memory for things, but the two kinds of memory apparently work together as complementary alternatives, because both, unlike speech, rely upon signs and space deployed in service of memory. Now, some traditions credit Pythagoras with the creation of the letter Upsilon that resembles our capital Y. Regardless of whether or not this is true, it shows how the letter was endowed with mnemonic significance independent of its phonetic value. It was said to represent human life and the forking moment of choice between the path of virtue and the path of vice. The image of the forking path is a commonplace in the West, running from the sophist Prodicus up through the dream of Scipio, which was memorialized by Cicero, and then in turn played a large role in medieval uh, teaching and educational programs, and all the way up through to the art of the European Renaissance. So it served as a more or less stable mnemonic for 2,000 years and it's anchored by a letter without much thought to the phonetical, uh, phonetic significance of the letter itself. 
So evidently, letters could be used to anchor both memory for words and memory for things, which underscores the variety of modes in which they can signify. We should bear in mind that letters also served as numerals in many alphabets. They clearly had multivalent significance from the outset, or at least close to the outset. Mnemonic association works whether it extends from abbreviations to complete words, phrases, or texts, or from letters and words to the things they indicate, or from things, as distinct from words, to other things without recourse to words either spoken or written. So it's worth asking, why are our sources distinguishing between memory for words and memory for things? After all, text, alphabetic writing, syllabaries, they all qualify in some fashion as a kind of memory for things of their own. We use words to refer to all things. And we've even heard references in some early presentations to people, I think it was Francis who said that, you know, it can represent all thought. Well, to get a sense of this, I think it's necessary to look at a little bit more broader context. In his work on the soul, Aristotle mentions that thinking is something we can do whenever we like because, quote, we can present an object before our eyes, as do those who range things under mnemonic headings and picture them to themselves. And he opens his work on memory and reminiscence with, quote, as this has been said before in my treatise on the soul about imagination, it's impossible even to think without a mental picture. And there are many examples of this idea. Many. Plutarch wrote that Simonides calls painting silent poetry and poetry painting that speaks. Michael Sellos, writing roughly a thousand years later in Constantinople, attributes to Simonides the statement that the word is the image of the thing. This is possibly an echo of the same tradition that's preserved in Plutarch. And to reach back further in time, in a summary of Book One of Antiphons on Truth from the 5th century BC, uh, we read, mind rules the body, but needs a starting point. The starting point is the senses. We all believe what we see with our eyes more than abstractions. But when we speak, there is no permanent reality behind our words. Nothing, in fact, comparable to the results of seeing and knowing. These same ideas probably motivate Horace's famous statement, ut pictura poesis, as his painting, so is poetry, and even uh, Cato the elder's pragmatic rem tene verba sequentor, meaning grasp the things and the words will follow. So it seems that image-based cognition, and I want to be explicit about the fact that this is essentially spatial cognition, was accepted as an epistemological necessity. But let's return to the question of why the distinction is made if the mnemonic techniques preserved in our sources were developed before the widespread emergence of linguistic writing in the region. Distinguish memory for, distinguishing memory for words from memory for things might make sense. On the other hand, as we touched on, alphabetic writing is itself a system of memory for words, and it certainly existed in Greece in the 6th and 5th centuries. So why would our sources have bothered with the redundancy of memorizing a picture to recall a word that could easily be represented with letters? It seems likely that the aforementioned epistemological emphasis on images provides the answer. Letters or syllables cue memory of sounds, which, when considered at the level of the corresponding phonological unit, are more or less devoid of emotional charge, leaving aside religious texts associated with Sanskrit and the rest. But the phonological units themselves are devoid of an emotional charge that was traditionally associated with the image qua image. If this seems far-fetched, we should remember that at this time, letters were relatively new. And writing conventions were still being formalized. Letters were being created, and new words were being coined. There are all kinds of sophist texts that go into how words can be formed, why they should be formed, what are the right and wrong ways of doing so. And many of us will also recall that when letters were new to us, we relied upon association with images in space in order to fix them in our memories. We're told that a is for apple, C is for cat, but that goes the other way. C, uh, excuse me, cat is for C, apple is for A. And note that these letters and images have been placed on simple three-dimensional objects, blocks, 
that can be manipulated, arranged, and rearranged in real space. So, in an attempt to form sort of a unified integrationist perspective, some of these things, we'll take a look at uh, some things considered in parallel. As we've seen, Aristotle emphasized that thought cannot take place without images, images which ultimately derive from sense impressions. And of course, all sense impressions, whatever their mode, are integrated in a model of experience which is fundamentally spatial. The role of space in any integrated experience is also emphasized by the philosopher Kant, who wrote, space is nothing but the form of all appearances of outer sense. It is the subjective condition of sensibility under which alone outer intuition is possible for us. So it plays a synthetic role in our representations of our environments, and it serves to link our uh, memories, to knit our memories together, and to organize our behavior both individually and in groups. In the following slides, I'd like to quickly consider how integrational semiology can help us to identify shared features in phenomena that are usually <coughs> considered in a disconnected way, if they're even compared at all. This will help us to contextualize the art of memory that we just considered. So if we take a look at non-linguistic marks in space, this is applying the integrationist model of writing, but explicitly to animals. So the idea of a telemetational model where you know, the dog is going to talk to the other dog and they're going to bark and that bark means something that the other dog recognizes and so the message passed along a, some sort of proto-speech circuit to the dog's brain. Well, that's gone. Obviously, we can't establish these things. And this is important for us because if we look back into prehistory, there are a lot of cases where we can't figure out what something stands for. But we do have a chance of figuring out what the behavior is, how it's contextualized, and how it's organized and brought together through writing. If we take a look at an example of, uh, of bathrooms before we jump into this slide, you look at the signs on bathroom doors, and they're a male and a female. Neither one of those symbols say anything about it being a restroom. Now, you'll often find them combined with text. They'll say something like WC as an abbreviation, or they'll say toilet. But in places where you've got large groups of people mixing, who may come from different backgrounds, places, linguistic groups, cultures, then the symbols themselves, the signs that are non-linguistic, tend to be emphasized. And what they're really saying to us isn't anything about bathrooms. They're marking out a given space in service of the integration of behavior and indicating that in that given space, only women may enter. Only men may enter. And the depth at which that, that Behavior is integrated is such that if we find ourselves accidentally walking into the same bathroom, I'll admit it, it's happened before. I swear it was an accident. There's a, there's a strong sense of disorientation. Like, whoa, 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 I need to get out of here. This is not where I'm supposed to be. We can imagine animals who are surrounded by environmental signs that have been changed on them. Or if another dog came along this one's route and started setting up scent marks and the first animal gets disoriented, something's wrong. So. In this case, we're talking about something sort of like this. It's non-linguistic, and it's a way that animals integrate their behavior, and they do it in, through two types of spatial localization. The first is egocentric spatial localization. This is orientation based on where an animal has been. It's established based on the orientation movement of the body itself. So if I'm facing forward, that's where forward is. Now, among animals, scent marks and visible marks in space facilitate egocentric spatial localization, which in turn integrates behavior across time. It's important to note that we're talking about both scent marks and visible marks, because this allows us to step away from the idea that it has to be visual. Writing has no, there's no necessity that writing be visual, otherwise things like braille wouldn't work. It's fundamentally spatial. Same thing with scent marks, and I think this shows the breadth of the applicability of Harris's model. Now, the, other mode of orientation is allocentric spatial localization. This involves mechanisms that locate the animal with respect to some external frame of reference, such as landmarks or environmental geometry. Here, too, olfactable and visible marks integrate individual and group behavior in time and space. What we're looking at on the right here is a uh, diagram representing how an animal represents, uh, or I'm sorry, organizes space around it through marked environments. So there are sites for food caches, feeding and bathing places, drinking, and there are 
there's demarcations at the borders. Now, integrational semiology provides a ready-to-use framework for analysis of the marked environment as a form of writing, and it can be applied to non-human animals as easily as it can be to human animals. This is only possible because integrational semiology focuses on the contextualized integration of behavior, showing no necessary concern for any so-called transmission of messages, as I said. And as we talked about before, because any given instance of integrational analysis is context dependent, it can be applied with great flexibility across species. Let's jump over to a different form of space, again, covered by the integrational semiology in terms of their approach to writing. This semiology applies equally well to analysis of the spatial relations that underpin writing in general, and linguistic writing in particular. In Signs of Writing, Harris proposes that every text needs a graphic space in which to be situated for purposes of reading. This space may or may not be shared with other signs which are not forms of writing. He goes on to say that the determination of graphic space in which a text is situated yields a division within the text between external and internal syntagmatics. External syntagmatics covers the various relationships which may obtain between the written forms and items or events to which they are significantly, significantly connected on the space outside. So when we look at a, uh, a sign showing us directions, for example, at an intersection, this is meaningless without being referred to the surrounding space. So if a bunch of teenagers get drunk one night and decide to turn it around, we've got real problems with this sign, which means it has to be conceived of within the broader spatial context. Now what's strange about writing proper is that it contracts that spatial context, which I believe we see as a substratum in animal marking, which is space itself with a mark in it. And so, for example, if this were a plane and this were my territory, there would be marks in different places that would help me to organize my behavior. What happens with the text is it, writing proper, is it contracts and becomes more formalized and allows for more expression, more significance, based on these spatial rules that are involved with the writing surface itself. If it's autumn, it might be uh, scratches or marks cut on the posts, right, that are vertical. It might be a flat plane. It could be uh, a string, for that matter. So the internal syntagmatics relate to the disposition of written forms relative to one another and to other forms within the same graphic space. So the arrangement of lines of writing on a page features such as direction and alignment. In that the formal substratum of writing is recognized as spatial, and that writing qua writing shows no necessary relationship to spoken language, integrational semiology provides a theoretical framework with broad applicability to both non-linguistic marks and linguistic writing. So to come back around, We've got places and images in virtual space. So we've seen it with animals. Space, marking the environment, integration of individual and group behavior and potential. Same with written texts that qualify as writing proper. Now, having sketched how an integrationist perspective reveals the reliance upon space that both linguistic and non-linguistic uh, writing share, we can take a look at the ancient mnemonics and see that space is again emphasized as foundational in all our Latin sources. And the preoccupation with images, which necessarily entail the representation of space, is implicit in our earlier Greek sources. Rules for images can be compared to egocentric orientation relative to a given memory scene based on one's point of view. And you see here uh, on the left, this is uh, from the 16th dimensions of the individual person who's viewing the space, much like the, the consistent theme with all the measurement systems that go back through time. We've got spans, we've got cubits, we've got a foot, we've got paces. The way in which we mark out our external environment is, in most cultures, directly related to the application of our body itself as a measuring instrument. So in the formation of areas in space that are supposed to hold our images, these same rules hold. Rules for places introduce a broader basis for orientation, uniting sets or series of images within larger arrangements that derive order from space. The one on the right here is an artificial memory representation of uh, hell. So you can see where the hypocrites and the proud and uh, the envious and the idolaters all go. 
but space is divided and the images can then be populated within the spaces and they develop reputedly very complex sets of memory places that were all interrelated and used them to uh, hold content in their memory. From an integrationist perspective, the art of memory appears to qualify as a form of writing, and arguably buildings as well, with marks upon them, would qualify as forms of writing. And this would begin to help us to understand why there's this consistent uh, association of writing with monumental inscriptions, uh, also the writing that appears on individual objects, like if we look at some of the earliest uh, written inscriptions that we find in alphabetic writing in Greece, or things like X made me. Right? So you take a look at whatever the object is, and so-and-so made me, which means I'm the product of so-and-so. I come from this lineage, much like uh, someone's last name in Spain or Portugal. You know, They've got both the male bloodline and the female bloodline appended to their name to, to show what their origin is. Now that same function can be served by a non-linguistic mark, be a clan sign, family sign, tribal sign, ownership mark, property mark. So we can see how non-linguistic writing or marking and linguistic writing can be switched out in a number of respects, particularly in situations where you're dealing with external syntagmatics. When you contract to internal syntagmatics, that's where the marking systems can't keep up with the sophistication of the linguistic writing systems and how they organize that internal space. Because communication is defined as the contextualized integration of behavior, writing as integrationally defined doesn't strictly require any transmission of messages between individuals. Thus, the theoretical framework can be applied in analysis of the behavior of single individuals over time. So writing can serve an integrational function for one person without any recourse to socially constructed identities or synchronous um, uh, use of a given terminology and a language that seems to exist independently from people uh, somehow outside of the speech acts itself. You can write a diary. And looking back on your own diary, you can use it to integrate your behavior. You can scratch your initials and those of someone you fell in love with when you were young on a tree and return to that place when you're, when you're older, remember the event, remember the person, and actually relive it because of the mark in space. So this is the kind of way that integrational semiology can be applied to the mnemonic framework. Now if we jump over We've seen that the spatial organization of signs is common to animal marking, human marking, writing proper, and ancient mnemonics, at least arguably so. This suggests the possibility of a neurobiological basis for the shared formal substratum. John O'Keefe, May Grit Moser, and Edvard Moser were awarded the Nobel Prize this year for their discovery of cells that constitute a positioning system in the brain, as it is uh, described in popular accounts in the news. They also say things like the GPS system of the brain. O'Keefe first discovered place cells in the hippocampus in 1971. Place cells fire consistently when an animal is in a given location, providing an organized map of space based on activity patterns. But place cells only go part of the way because there is no correspondence between the plate, well, I should say, there's no spatial correspondence in the arrangement of the place cells and space itself, though the same cells fire when the same position is passed. But so this was a beginning, and he threw forth some uh, great hypotheses, but it was very, very controversial. Well, the interpretation of this discovery stayed controversial until in 2005 the Mosers discovered what are called grid cells in a part of the brain known as the medial anterior cortex which is closely related to the hippocampus. Grid cells exhibit hexagonal activity patterns, which we can see over here on the right, stretching over the space traversed, similar to longitude and latitude lines on a map. And what needs to be emphasized here is when you scan the cells in question, or the area where the cells in question are active, that hexagonal arrangement actually appears. That's not a, a expressive diagram. So we now have a, a neurobiological correspondence between our representations of space and that space itself. Now, border of boundary cells were uh, hypothesized, or predicted, I should say, by O'Keefe early on, and they have now recently been identified. It's very interesting when you look at this together with non-linguistic 
uh, marked use among animals because border or boundary cells fire in response to proximity to an environmental boundary. So if, for example, I'm a, 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 a wolf coming up to a region that's part of uh, my territory and I know that it overlaps with another, these cells are going to kick off in, my, uh, in the brain to signal the fact that you're approaching a boundary. And when we look back at how non-linguistic marks are consistently throughout history um, associated with territory and dominion, milestones, the measurement of travel, uh, borders, terminus, termini, it suggests that there is some relation there between the uh, neurological function and the expression that it perhaps finds in how we use non-linguistic marks in our environment. These place, border, and boundary cells are a critical part of how an animal orients, orients itself in relation to its environment, which is to say they're fundamental to neurological representations that directly correspond to fate, space. It's worth emphasizing, and I just want to throw this in here at the end, that the hippocampus and the entorenal cortex are not only critical for orientation in space, they're also central to the formation of memories in their own ways, both uh, semantic and episodic. So we've been looking at writing. We see that it has a mnemonic dimension, and we see that it's directly tied to space. We turn around and we see that recent discoveries show us neural representations of space that assist in orientation, and consequently, unavoidably, in the integration of our individual behavior over time, and the integration of groups. And these things are tied also directly to memory. Five minutes, OK. Pardon? Five minutes. <coughs> The final point I want to tap today concerns convergence in research across disciplines. I believe the recent discoveries that earned O'Keefe and the Mosers their well-deserved recognition will lead to important developments in semiological theory. A commonplace of Greco-Roman culture was the idea that art imitates nature. And we had heard about the uh, natural memory upon which any artificial memory must be based, which suggests a degree of sophistication on the part of the ancients, given what we've seen now with um, how place cells, uh, grid cells, and border cells fire, that is uh, that we have yet to equal with our many arguably arbitrary semiological systems that seem to drift and flow all over the place. Once you establish space as the fundamental feature and focus on the integration of behavior rather than trying to figure out what something stands for, the whole playing field opens up. So it seems that the art of memory it is no exception to this rule that the artificial memory will be based on the natural memory. It, it appears that it, like marking and writing, directly reflects the neurological foundations of how we orient in space and remember our experiences. Thank you very much for your attention and patience.